Hold on, before we start anything, probably should explain the video thumbnail and title. I have to speak very carefully about this. Certain problems YouTubers are going through that are heavily affected by a certain name that is attached to a certain brand. Let's just say check out some of my more recent tweets and you can find out why I didn't put a particular name in the title or thumbnail. But I think you guys understand what this is a review of. And also, by the way, before we begin, just I wanted to say the Google Pixel 2 is is the greatest smartphone ever invented. Keep in mind, here are my thoughts on this particular device. So we haven't seen much change in the iPhone lineup for so many years. That's what people were getting sick of all this time. We've got the iPhone 6 design, we saw 6s, 7, then the 8, and now, for the first time in a very long time, we've got a display change, and I think that, not just removing bezels, is the most noticeable thing we see in this year's new iPhone. When people want something to be new, and when they want a big change to a product, changing the display is the most recognizable and easy way to notice that. So, that's why I want to start off by talking about the display. I was expecting thinner bezels, okay? That was something that's standard in 2017. Makes sense that Apple would be doing it. Though I do have to say the display has exceeded a lot of my expectations. So first of all, the most vivid change, it has to be the colors. The amount of vividness I see in pictures and videos now, the viewing angles, the pixel density, which is now at 458 pixels per inch. Definitely not the highest out there. I understand other Android phones that are extremely great, amazingly awesome, great Android phones out there have had higher pixels per inch, but I have to say that this is the first time I'm seeing it on this operating system, on this layout, and it is noticeably better than the phones I've used in the past. Having True Tone on such a small display after I've enjoyed it so much on my iPad has been fabulous, and I love seeing it adapt to the different color temperatures of the rooms I'm in. I find it being easier on the eyes, especially how that partners with Night Shift. And this is a great example of how a lot of people say Apple's never the first to something, but they are always the ones who perfect it. I think when it comes to OLED tech, technology, this is a perfect example. Tons of phones have used OLED before, right? This is the first iPhone to use OLED, and boy, did they get it right. I've used lots of displays in my life. I've used the Galaxy S8. We've heard great and amazing, beautiful things about the Pixel 2 display. We've absolutely loved it. There's been zero complaints about the Pixel 2 display, and of course, Samsung makes great displays overall, and they designed this one as well. Still, just from a viewing standpoint of looking at colors and vividness and crispness, this has been the best display I've ever ever had the pleasure of looking at. For those of you who don't know, the contrast ratio is a million to one, and previously, as it was on the iPhone 8 and iPhone 7, it was 1300 to one. So this is a monumental leap forward. And even when I hand this phone to people who aren't really tech enthusiasts, who just kind of use any day phones, when they watch content on here, they are impressed. They look at it from different angles and say, wow, this is impressive. I love just handing my new phone to people and asking what they think of the notch, the new display, and most of the time, in fact, 100% of the time, I've only really gotten positive feedback. There's very few people I've handed it to that just immediately are annoyed by the notch. Most of them love the colors and love the vividness, and it's just something I wasn't expecting, so I want you guys to be clear. The display alone is being rated as some of the best smartphone displays ever. This is accurate. Of course, directly behind the Google Pixel 2, which has the best display. So with this new display and with this new bezel-less design, I think it's fair to mention ergonomics. The form factor for this iPhone has been perfect. It is the largest display we've ever seen on an iPhone and yet reaching all the way to the bottom and reaching all the way to the top to access control center works fine for me. I know a lot of YouTubers complain about that. They don't like control center being at the top. I've seen some ideas on how they can move it into multitasking or maybe swipe up from the bottom instead. All things I'd probably be okay with, but I just like to mention that I do not consider it a con of this iPhone that control center is up here or that the display is too tall. I've let my friends use this who have much smaller hands than me. I'm a 5'11 guy. I have very large hands, so reach around on this thing has been no problem for me, but I'm saying for even people with smaller hands, I still think this works. It's still a form factor that is fitting to people who are accustomed to the standard size iPhone 8 or 7. And see, back when we were talking about all the leaks for this phone, a lot of people were saying that yes, the display is larger, but less of the display will be in quote, usable screen space compared to the 8 plus or 7 plus. Where in fact, because Apple made the giant switch to gestures, all of this is usable space. Every single piece of this phone displays content 
in some way. And the way you interact with it doesn't have to take up and intrude on the display you're looking at, the content you're trying to watch or interact with. But while we're talking about ergonomics, I have to mention that stainless steel on an iPhone gives an incredibly good feel. It's still very, very light, but it feels rigid. There's no cracks or pops that sometimes you may have heard on your iPhone 7 when bent in wrong directions. The glass and stainless steel design, while some drop tests show it being very fragile and shattering easily, other drop tests have shown it being extremely durable, even at extreme measures. Either way, I think that you shouldn't drop your phone. If you're a clumsy person, definitely get a case, definitely get Apple Care. But in terms of smartphones I've used in my time, this definitely has to be the most structurally sound and very firm feeling device. It does not feel fragile to me, and yet still feels very, very light and easy to hold. Now, like I was mentioning earlier, this iPhone makes a big jump with gestures. Ditching the home button causes a lot of controversy. If some of you guys have been subscribed for a while, you know that when I found out about this idea for the home bar, the idea that at the bottom here you swipe up to go home, I wasn't okay with that. I was expecting a virtual home button, and I was hoping that Apple would basically just move all of the home button features onto the display, just like Galaxy has done it, and just like the clearly superior Google Pixel 2 has done it. Apple thought about this way more than I did, and it ultimately ended up being a very good thing that they did this. Like I said, with gestures, you don't have a bottom of the display that is wasted with space. You see, on certain other phones that are clearly superior, you have on-screen buttons that you touch, but they're always there, and that means that they're cutting in on your content, they're covering up things, or if you're watching a video or something, you have to swipe out from the side to bring out those buttons and then interact with them. With this particular iPhone, it's so intuitive and so simple to just have this bar at the bottom that you swipe up from because it's not intruding on your content. It's almost invisible. You don't even really see it when you're using it. It just becomes a very quick muscle memory to swipe up to go home, swipe up and hold to access multitasking. There's actually like an infinite ways to access multitasking. You can swipe up and hold. You can swipe up from the side. You can make kind of an L shape action. There's a ton of different options with how you access multitasking, but I find them a lot more intuitive than just double tapping the home button or having a dedicated multitasking button. And I think for the sake of right now, getting people to transition over to not having a home button, they're leaving the home bar in all the apps. I know that's not the official name as of right now, but I think like maybe in the future, Apple could very easily provide an option to not have that bar at the bottom, just so it has a more cleaner look and just let people know. People know how to get home. We have gestures. We've been using them for a while. There's no need for a bar at the bottom. And I think maybe right now it's just a transitional period. Perhaps someday in the future, we won't even need that. And then because we'll be so accustomed to gestures, there will be no need for on-screen buttons because that intrudes on our content. Now, while we're talking about this new aspect ratio, as well as the new display, new gestures, I wanted to bring up optimization because back when the iPhone 6 first came out, we had these two new sizes. It took a very long time for third-party apps and even Apple's apps to get optimized on those larger displays. Same story when the iPhone 4 updated to the iPhone 5. I got this on launch day. You know, I stood out in line. I did a whole vlog about that and I activated it the day this came out and yet tons of third-party apps as well as Apple certified apps were already optimized for this phone. It was amazing. Apps like Google Drive and YouTube and Venmo and PayPal and even Discord were already designed to go up on this giant new aspect ratio and they were already ready. I wanted to give mad props to Apple to making sure they contact their individual developers and say, remember, update your phone for our new aspect ratio. This is very, very important and we want our users to experience the full benefits. And of course, there's definitely a ton of apps made by certain companies that are not yet optimized. That happens at every time you change the pixel density, every time you change aspect ratios, of course that happens. One of them shockingly is iMovie. Yeah, no kidding. The iMovie app is literally not optimized yet for this phone. It'll happen eventually, I know, but I just thought it was weird. But in terms of updating apps for a new aspect ratio and in a new dimension and everything, the upgrade to this phone has definitely been more substantial and more seamless than phone upgrades I've had in the past. Now, while we're talking about optimization as well, let's talk about that controversial thing that everyone loves to point out. Every single person has to look at it that notch, or as Apple likes to call it, the proximity sensor. So I've had kind of a phase in a change in opinion of the notch as time has gone on. Back when this phone was first leaked and I saw pictures of the notch, I went, eh, that's very unlike Apple. I don't think Apple would make a display that is so asymmetrical and so bizarre like that. Usually they're just making square displays, rectangular displays. And then as leaks went on and we found out that that design was more verified, I was like, okay, I can start to understand why they would do that. And it seems like this is really going to happen. So I better be ready for it. It must happen for Face ID, which I'll get into in a little bit, in order to have a secure unlock 
unlocking procedure that replaces touch id the notch needs to be there so and essentially i looked at it as a necessary evil as in yeah the notch is a little bit annoying but it's at the top of the phone you don't look up there very much and you get used to it you know it won't be too distracting then i got the iphone in my opinion on the notch has now changed again i actually am starting to prefer the notch on phone and i'm actually kind of not looking forward to the day when they figure out a way to remove it i'm sure a lot of you are confused right now let me explain basically all smartphones at the top of the display likes to stuff information up there it makes sense you want quick info you want quick widgets and stuff you put them at the top because most people are interacting with the bottom reading top to bottom so starting anything at the very very top of the display makes sense for it to be you know widget like that's why we have battery wi-fi cellular time that belongs up there right well different companies have different approaches of how they handle it so with a lot of android phones that are clearly superior they like to have notifications put up there and that can kind of get extensive very quickly you got tons of icons up there and i understand you can alter it so that it only shows three i get that there's options in android but what i appreciate about the notch is that it forces the operating system to only show the absolute necessities it does not put any more than it needs to and in fact when it needs to alert you of something that icon that widget will take up the space of the other so for instance typically in the top corner you've got battery wi-fi and cellular when you let something charge the battery takes up all of that space lets you know that it's charging and then shrinks back down now when you have a screen recording or you do a hot spot it just puts a bubble around the time it doesn't have to light up the entire top of your phone and make all of your apps crunch down and no you don't need to have your carrier name in the top of your phone at all times i found it incredibly annoying on older phones that at all times at the very top of the phone it needed to say verizon no matter what and it's like verizon i'm using you i'm on your contract if you expect me to remember five different passwords to get into my account you can assume i remember the name of the company okay it doesn't have to be constantly on the phone the notch prohibits that from happening it forces all of these icon widgets to be efficient now i bring that up because most of the time that's the orientation in which you're going to be viewing the notch because of this aspect ratio most of the time you're using this iphone it's going to be in portrait mode but of course we know when you're watching videos or playing games it's going to be tilted to the side and yeah in that instance the notch is a tiny bit intrusive but i have to say as i've mentioned earlier i have handed this phone to a lot of people while it's playing a video and showed them how the notch does overlay the video they're watching and again they bring up the display they bring up how natural it looks and how good the viewing angles are and the curved corners and how it feels like they're just kind of holding a video that's playing it doesn't even feel like a phone anymore they're more impressed by the display quality and the notch is kind of a necessary evil in that regard and again when you're watching videos especially if you're on youtube or the videos app watching a movie or anything it's incredibly easy to erase the notch for people who are not interested in having the notch or just want to get it out of there as much as possible a lot of apps will intentionally bury it so apps like discord even though they are optimized for this phone they intentionally will black out the top and make the notch hard to see it's also very easy to get wallpapers that will black out the notch so that it goes away and especially when watching videos when you're tilted to the side you can easily double tap or pinch out and whether it's youtube netflix or itunes movies you can choose to have the notch not there your bezels are going to look a little bit thicker but that would happen on an iphone 8 anyway so i can totally understand people not liking it i've watched a lot of youtubers talk about it and a lot of them say it's invisible you get used to it and a lot of them say it's annoying i can't get over it especially samsung who likes to make fun of that i'm saying i actually prefer it because it forces the top of the phone to stay minimalistic and i've also heard a lot of comments from you guys that just say it's an iconic look if we removed the notch and had the same size bezel all the way around it would be kind of a generic looking phone and while i'd like to say that i think that's where eventually we're heading to i do appreciate that they're forced to be efficient with all these widgets at the top i like that there's not much data up there now i like that they keep it minimal and i think via software updates over time we can add more things like showing your battery percentage one concept i saw that was really smart was instead of showing the battery icon like we traditionally do at the top show a circular complication with the percentage in the center similar to what we do on our apple watches on the apple watch you just have a circle that progressively goes down with the percentage in the middle it's a very simple way to check your battery life just put it on the iphone it'd be very simple okay so that's enough talk about the notch i even made a whole video about the notch so please check that out if you haven't yet the better question though why is the notch there of course it's for face id and i hate to plug myself again but i also did a video on face id versus touch id if you want more elaboration on this you can check that out but for me personally and of course this changes from person to person it has been the best way to unlock my phone i've ever used i've tried to use fingerprint readers and i've talked about this so many times i have a skin disease known as psoriasis it prevents me from being able to use any fingerprint reader and i've also seen comments from people saying sometimes i'm sweaty sometimes i'm working out sometimes i'm busy or i'm cooking 
working. And in that regard, Touch ID, kind of a hassle. It doesn't register that well. And there's a whole nother list of diseases out there that prevent Touch ID from working on a lot of people. It's not an uncommon thing to say that Touch ID doesn't work for me. I know a lot of people that for that reason alone have to use the standard passcode unlock. But yeah, while I've seen Face ID act a little bit slower than Touch ID in perfect scenarios, I've seen YouTubers talk about the fact that, you know, you still have to swipe up to unlock your phone even after Face ID unlocks, whereas Touch ID doesn't. Yes, it can be slower, I'm sure, but the thing is Face ID is applicable to more scenarios. It allows for features like Animoji, which I know a lot of people make the joke, the $1,000 Animoji machine. While it may look stupid, and yes, you're right, no one out there thinks it looks cool to do Animoji stuff. Every single person I have handed this phone to, even Android users, and showed them the Animoji feature, they start to have a little bit of fun with it. And what's even more fun than Animoji is watching someone else use Animoji. They look hilarious, and it's still really, really fun to play with. It's one of those exclusive features that's like, yes, I have this phone, I can do that feature, no one else can do it, and it's just, it's fun to play with. That's what Apple's good at, making things that work well, and you enjoy using them, and I think that that's what Animoji helps with. Also, Face ID enables content awareness, which means that if you have not looked at your phone yet, it will not load personal messages, personal data on the lock screen, but when you do look at your phone, and it registers that you're looking at it, all of those messages will then unlock and show you that private data, which is not possible with Touch ID. And also when you're accessing things like your iCloud passwords, your keychain, the fact that you're using your phone and you hit a certain website that has your keychain preloaded, it just activates Face ID like that because you're already using your phone, it unlocks, and boom, it unlocks like that. You don't have to rest your fingerprint on the fingerprint reader to access your certain passwords. The fact that you're already using your phone means it unlocks like that, certain apps can unlock like that, and I'm sure that in time, banks will even let you view your information just using your face. So while yes, Face ID might be a little bit slower than Touch ID, again, applies to more scenarios. I remember using the Galaxy S8's iris scanner, and by no means is that a bad way to unlock the device, but the fact that it has to show you your own face and make sure that your eyes are exactly where they need to be shows that iris scanning is a bit more precise. It works in a lot fewer conditions, and most of the time, I don't even notice that Face ID is being used. I'm literally just walking up to my phone, swiping up, and it unlocks. I don't notice it. Whereas back when I used the Galaxy S8, it was like, find my eyes, or at certain times of the night, I would have to open my eyes wider than they already were. So I'm not trying to say that the iris scanner is completely useless, I'm just saying that Face ID works in more scenarios. And yes, the S8 has face unlock, but it's using a 2D image. You can trick that with a photograph. Face ID, very hard to fool in that regard. It's far more secure. Now, Face ID is possible with cameras, which is something we love to talk about in smartphones these days. I've had quite a few debates about them in the past. To no surprise, the Apple Sheep finds that this iPhone has the best cameras of all time. Now, a lot of people have complaints with portrait mode. I love that it's accessible on both the front and rear facing cameras. And even though a lot of it's in beta and I do think it will be better in the future, I still think it's pretty good now. I think a lot of people like to dock the front facing mode and say that it's not good at masking. It doesn't get things right. In my experience, no, it might not get the lines exactly right, but that does not mean that the pictures are terrible. There may be small imperfections with your selfie, but try it from a couple angles. And of course this will get better over time. It is not masked me perfectly every single time, but I still think that the pictures look awesome. And that's not even to mention the ones on the rear facing camera, which also look incredible. I think that this iPhone is the best for videographers with their smartphones. There's so many different options between slow-mo at 1080p up to 240 frames a second. You can shoot 4K at 24, 30, or 60 FPS. Not something most people can do. And you have cinematic video stabilization, which is extremely noticeable when you're in 1080p. For those of you who don't know, when you're filming in 4K, there's a certain level of stabilization that's not quite activated because it's using the entire sensor. But still, the optical image stabilization is extremely noticeable on the telephoto lens now, since it wasn't there on the iPhone 8 Plus or 7 Plus. And in terms of the stage lighting features that a lot of people say has not been perfected yet, no, they're definitely not done with it. That's why it's in beta. But I've still gotten plenty of scenarios where it has worked out. I know lots of YouTubers like to point out where it doesn't work. I'm a little biased. So you know what? I'm going to point out where it does work. And I've used several pictures with stage lighting mode on and I think it looks great and I see the potential in it and I can't wait for the future iOS updates that are coming that are going to make it work even better. So don't think that's all I'm going to say about the cameras. If you didn't know, I have a channel called Talos of Talks where I do vlogging and stuff. The most recent vlog on that channel was filmed with this phone at 4K at 60. So you're not getting the cinematic video stabilization, but if you're watching it in Google Chrome, you can enjoy that crispness frame rate and high resolution. It looks very, very nice. I've been very impressed with the camera. And of course the link to that channel is in the description if you want to check out 
what the cameras look like. There will be more videos on the future when we have more smartphones to compare it to. And of course, more camera videos for this phone. We can go more in depth in that later. This is an overall review. Got to make time for other things as well. Now, since I think that the camera is top notch, has that joke been made yet? How many people have commented that already? What about Apple's controversial use of ports? I think that this year's iPhone lineup is proof that Apple is saying wireless is the future. I think Apple is fully showing us that they have full intentions on removing the last port. And the fact that the lightning port is still there is really just to make sure that it is compatible with your old chargers. If Apple was thinking that ports were the future and that we should have the best ports possible on our phones, they would have put USB-C on it by now. They're really pushing USB-C see on the MacBook and iMac lineup. They're hoping everyone moves to that. Why haven't they moved it to their iOS devices yet? It's because they know they are so close to ditching them altogether. Now that they're adopting Qi wireless charging, and keep in mind, remember my portless challenge I asked you all to do? That's still applying here. I have not plugged a single thing into this phone. Charging wirelessly, using AirPods with it, wireless headphones, and that's what Apple is encouraging you to do. With Bluetooth 5.0, them pushing wireless so heavily, and now with wireless charging, I think that Apple's trying to convey that message that that is the new standard. It's great that some of my Samsung friends that have Galaxy phones are able to drop their phones on the Qi chargers at my office and at home. And at the same time, I can drop my iPhone on those Qi chargers and we have the same pads everywhere that wirelessly charge our phones and it works great. And Apple, of course, has ditched the headphone jack. They're trying to encourage you to move to that wireless future. Apple knows they have a very loyal fan base that includes me and knows that they almost have a responsibility to push people towards the future because if no one ditches the headphone jack, there would be no need need to quit using it. There would be no need to try to find something better. There would be no push to make headphones better, to make wireless technology better, which I think already at this point can sound just as good. And of course, be far more convenient than having a cable going into your pocket, getting tangled, having cables break. Wireless is the future. Apple is embracing that both in charging and in data. Now, also a lot of people are curious about this elongated side button on the side. And I think it's a great thing because it shows that Apple is all about efficiency. Everything they add to a particular product has to have have multiple functions. So the home button did a lot of things for us, right? Multitasking, went home, Siri, touch ID, reachability. And now that that's gone, the side button picks up a lot of the slack that gestures could not replace with the home button. What I like is they didn't do something like the Galaxy product and say that Bixby is so, so good. We love the digital assistant so much. It's so much the best. We're so confident you're going to love it that we're going to make you use it by having a dedicated button on the side that's physical. You know, you cannot remove that button. And for a long time, you could not re route that button to anything else. That button is there. You are going to have four buttons while everyone else has three because Bixby is so good and we're sure you're going to love it. Apple doesn't try to force things like that. Siri, of course, can be accessed by the side button, but it's also just, you know, the, the power button. It's how you activate Apple Pay as well. And I like the way they handled that. The fact that when you need to send somebody money in Apple Pay Cash, you double click that side button. And instead of adding more buttons and adding more complications or things you're going to set off accidentally all the time, you just have one button that does a ton of things and I think that was smart I think that was efficient and it was definitely an Apple thing to do so let's talk about specifications for a second the a11 bionic chip is some of the highest performing processing power we've ever seen on a smartphone now some people have noticed that in terms of speed in terms of geekbench scores we've seen them performing a little bit lower on the 10 compared to the 8 and the 8 plus and I don't want people to fret I don't want them to be like a thousand dollars why are they reducing the processor speed they're not it's the same chip it's just doing so much more work on this device it's powering a much higher resolution display, a taller aspect ratio. It's trying to use content awareness with Face ID, whereas A11, the same chip, on a more standard iPhone 8 or 8 Plus, much lower resolution, no Face ID to worry about, no extra pixels to worry about, none of that high contrast ratio. So yeah, a lot of the A11 chip has more processing room to perform higher in those Geekbench results on those cheaper modeled phones because they're not doing as much. This iPhone's doing a lot more, which means that there's not as much room for Geekbench to perform as highly. But to be fair, the Geekbench scores for this phone have been still incredibly high and by no means bad. In fact, the most recent one I did was just a tiny bit lower than that I got on my 8 Plus. Now I'm hoping that later on down the road, maybe via minor software update or perhaps iOS 12, we'll finally get Bluetooth 5.0 fully taken advantage of. It's a really cool technology that advances wireless even further. And on Android devices, you can set up things like dual audio, where via Bluetooth, you can send audio to two different devices at the same time, which is really cool. 
cool. But as of now, there's no option to do that, even though they have the hardware to do it. Hopefully someday in the future, if you have software, they can update that. And even Johnny Ive has been saying in interviews that the 2018 iPhone has hardware that is incredibly advanced and it has a lot of features that are not yet unlocked that will be unlocked down the road via software updates. So I think that could be one of them. The fact that the hardware is ahead of the software is a great thing because software developers can update your phone from far away. And that just means that the longer you use this product, the better, the more features it's going to get. It's been performing great. I haven't experienced much lag and I haven't crashed the phone ever. Specs wise, it's doing just fine. And while we're on the topic of specs, I want to make sure I talk about battery. I always kind of forget to talk about battery when I'm reviewing smartphones. And then there's a reason for that. It's because I've never used a phone with a battery so bad or even so good that it made or broke the product. Most phones that are unveiled that are shown to you have battery lives that are pretty good. Some of them are a little bit better than others. It may mean you have to charge it a little bit sooner in the day. But one of the bigger reasons I don't like talking about battery is it seems to change over time a lot. Depending on the software you're running and depending on how old your phone is, battery life heavily varies. So in my personal experience, and I understand it's been different for everyone, it changes a lot. I've actually gotten my battery life to extend that of the 8 plus which already had a great battery life this easily lasts all day which i've been very happy about but then of course i've heard people saying they have much worse battery life i'm currently running the latest version of ios beta and battery's still fine not noticeably bad and not noticeably great it's standard you're typically going to have to charge it at the end of the day yeah but that's most phones i've used and if a phone has 10 percent 15 percent charge when i go to sleep it doesn't really matter because it's going to be charging anyway so battery life's great in the right conditions it can be better than that of a plus model phone but of course keep in mind with a big big asterisk at the bottom of that statement that it could very easily not perform that well it just depends on your specific scenario it's kind of been hard to tell exactly how good the battery's been doing because i love this design so much i love the approach they did with this phone so much that i'm actually not using my other tech in the apple ecosystem because this is such a delight to use i love the gestures i love the contrast ratio the display the look the feel uh, everything about it is great sadly my ipad starts to feel a little bit neglected even though it's great at multitasking and I still do use it on a daily basis It's not like it's not doing anything But most of the time now that I've paid all this money for such a nice product It's like I need to text or I need to browse social media. I'm gonna go to the iPhone. That's looking pretty good right now Now I've talked a lot about the phone itself and I'm sure a lot of what I've said has been kind of a repeat to you So now I want to kind of stop talking about the phone itself because it's clear that I think this is a home run I think this is the best smartphone that has ever happened besides the Google Pixel Let me talk about the release of this phone for a second because there was so much hype for this thing, so much demand, and so many of my fans joined this channel because of me talking about this particular phone. So what I wanted to say was, this design is the future. Apple says that this was originally intended for a 2018 release, and I think it shows. In fact, this device makes all of your other tech in the Apple ecosystem feel very dated. In fact, it feels very dated very quickly. Now everything seems so much more square, and you're wondering, why doesn't it unlock when I'm just looking at it? Why doesn't it have better contrast ratios? Why doesn't it rely more on gestures? And I just wanted to give credit to Apple where credit is due. I'm extremely proud of them for focusing on making as many of these things as possible first. They didn't take the misstep with trying to make seven different colors of them like they did with the iPhone 7, which of course made availability very difficult for a lot of people. And they didn't have a ton of storage configuration. So yeah, it's sad that you don't have many options in the checkout process, but in return, more people were able to get the phone itself, enjoy all of its great features earlier because they didn't feel so distracted with all of the different colors and storage configurations. I think they made up for that with all of the different cases you can get. They have a very wide selection of cases, both silicon and leather and folio, and also the exclusive wallpapers that you only will get with this phone that you cannot get on an iPhone 8 or an iPhone 7. There's still customizability, just wasn't provided with the hardware itself. And of course that may come later. As Apple figures out how to make Face ID more efficient in the manufacturing process, as they are able to generate these phones at a faster rate, I'm sure that they could add the blush gold option, as we saw with the iPhone 8 Plus, which looks really, really nice. A lot of people's go-to color. I could easily see that being brought over, or perhaps they'll get even more creative. Add in my idea for a product red version, which could look really, really cool, and luckily someone did a concept for it. Thank you very much for bringing my vision to life. One thing Apple was really bad about with this release of iPhone was keeping it a secret. Almost every single person who had access to YouTube knew exactly what the phone was going to look like months and months before its release. And I know Apple said they're trying to crack down on leaks and stuff, but it's like, it, it was almost a joke with this one. Of course, there were still surprises that we weren't expecting with this phone, but still, they were very, very bad at the element of surprise, which
with this year's generation. However, I think one thing they were very smart to do was not release it at the same time as the iPhone 8. They let the users, the very limited number of users who were just interested in a standard phone upgrade, get it in September. You know, they just walked in the store. I was one of them. Got their 8 and 8 Plus, thought they were pretty good and enjoyed them and left. And then reserved all of the massive wave of people who were willing to spend over $1,000 on their iPhone. They let them get it when there was enough to provide for everyone. They didn't try to rush the release. They didn't try to release it in September or October. They said, no, we'll be ready in November. That's when there'll be enough for everyone. And that way we don't have a ton of disappointed fans and customers. I'm extremely grateful. I'm a fan of a company that considers that kind of thing. They were very smart about this release. And speaking of price, I actually have the controversial opinion. I think it was a little too low. Not because smartphones should all cost a thousand dollars, but what I'm saying is Apple users who wanted a new iPhone this year saw that this phone was way too close in price with the 8 and 8 Plus. This phone looks better, works better, has more exciting features, has more options. And I don't think there's any competition to say that this phone is not as good as the cheaper one. It definitely is better in every single regard. It's the most drastic change we've ever seen to a phone upgrade, probably ever. I can't really think of an iPhone upgrade that was more substantial than this one. And it only cost $200 more than the standard 8 Plus. Especially if you decide to get the 256 gigabyte 8 Plus, you're less than $100 away from all of this beauty, all of these new features, all of these futuristic approaches that are not present on the 8 Plus. Which meant that, yeah, no one was really interested in the 8 or 8 Plus because they're so close to being able to afford this thing. Why not just go for this? I think that because this is a more premium product and it's not really supposed to come out till next year, it should have been more for the elite class. It should have been more of a luxury device and not necessarily a flagship competitor. Like I would say start the pricing at $1,200, but make it a really good package. Perhaps the storage options are only 128 gigabytes and 512, which would be insanely good. Include the fast charging brick, include lightning to USB-C, include a wireless charger with the package, include AirPods, and perhaps even include a terabyte of iCloud storage so you can compete with the Android market a little bit better. So it's been really, really fun following this phone for the past year and even before that, watching the leaks and rumors grow and watching the hype for this phone rise and finally see its release and finally see the excitement behind it. I wanna get a little bit emotional here. Um, I kind of relate to the phone, the idea of this phone. People expect a lot from it, right? They look at it and the first impression of the iPhone, it doesn't look incredibly special. It just looks like they added a notch, turned the cameras on the side. What's the big deal? But then as people start looking at it, as soon as they start seeing its exclusivity, they see how smartly it was designed. They see how this is the future. You find out that where it matters on this device, it counts. And in a similar way, I hope that my fans see that I am not the most luxurious channel out there. I don't have the best camera. I don't have the best mic. I don't have the best stand. I'll even admit I'm not the best to look at. But just like this phone, it may be different than a lot of other phones on the market. It took a very unique approach. But I think in a few years down the road, we're going to start to see that a lot of the design approaches that this phone took will end up being the standard for a lot of smartphones out there. And in a similar way, I can see a lot of the unique approaches I'm taking as being something that a lot of YouTubers will start to admit is the best way to do something. And it'll be a standard someday in the future. I could be wrong, but of course, this is just this is just a theory of mine. So we're wrapping it up here. In conclusion, I also think that this phone is the end of an era in a way. This is such a massive update. It really is a follow-up to the iPhone 7. A lot of the times I compare it to the 8 Plus, I know, but this is really a follow-up to last year's 7, and it will be a very long time before we see an iPhone upgrade that was as substantial as this one. You know, next year, I'm sure I can already tell you, uh, this model will get cheaper. It'll get some better improvements. It could remove the camera bulge. It's probably my single complaint. They'll introduce a bigger one. One, there will be one with a larger display. Maybe pretty quickly try to shrink down the notch or perhaps one day even remove it entirely. You can reduce bezel size a little bit on this phone for the little bezel that is left. I guess you could try to eliminate it, but this will be the new standard for how iPhones look for years and years to come. There's not gonna be as drastic design changes. And that's kind of the sad thing about giant iPhone upgrades like this is whenever there is a large substantial change in an iPhone lineup, it means that you're not going to get a large substantial change for years to come. There's definitely going to be exciting iPhone releases for the next few years, and I'm definitely going to be buying them and reviewing them thanks to you guys. But something tells me none of them will be quite like this one. None that are so full of excitement and so full of hype and to actually have my expectations met and then exceeded with this device is truly quite incredible. And I think the amount of innovation they put into this, we're going to start seeing put in to all of the other tech in the Apple ecosystem. And definitely every device
device that Apple releases from here on out, they're going to be asking the question, how can you make this next generation work more like the iPhone 10. The amount of intelligence and care they put into such a device makes me truly grateful that my job is to defend the best tech company on the market. Being Apple's defense lawyer, as a lot of people have called me, is incredibly easy because all you really have to do is try the product and they speak for themselves. Hope you guys enjoyed that review. Of course, I wanna know all your thoughts on this extremely overhyped iPhone. Just know that all those comments you'll be writing, I will be reading on this device. This is your Apple Sheep here, and I will see you in the next one. Take care.